And I wanted to call this other things. I had a hard time coming up with the title. But um, I'm actually I'm, uh, at end thought, but this is purely my own opinions. And this should not reflect at all upon the other wonderful people at end thought and what they think. But the um, main thing I have a disclaimer uh, is because uh, I do make fun of Java here a little bit. So. Um, but so basically, a little bit of history Python as both this one, right? And help and that one is on. I'll talk to this one. That's fine. Tur turn off the turn off the other ones for feedback. <laughs> feedback is uh, both are on. Ah, uh, I see. Okay. So uh, a little bit of history. Python started out as a teaching language, really. Guido wanted to create a simple language that's easy to teach people who don't know how to program, how to program, teach them about programming. And so what are the characteristics of a teaching language, right? You want to have readability. You want to have ease of use. It needs to fit in your head. You want to have incremental sense of accomplishment. You don't have to punch out, like I did when I was first learning XLib, 2,500 lines of C++ before you get a window. Uh, and that's all you get is a window. So, um, so basically, we call that getting things done. And then deployment. Now, no novice programmer is going to be coming and talking about packaging and deployment. What they really want is the looky what I did factor, right? So then, um, in a professional language, as a professional software developer, what do we want? We want readability, ease of use. It needs to fit in your head. Otherwise, you're constantly flipping back and forth to reference docs and all this other stuff. You want to get things done. Now, there's a couple other things like legacy integration and good library support. You don't have to reinvent every, every, everything that you need to use. And really, let's be honest, we want to have a look at what I did back then, right? <laughs> so, in fact, that's what this conference is about. So, um, so there's a lot of overlap here. It makes a great professional programming language. Um, and the things that we actually don't care about so much when push comes to shove, even though there's a lot of blog noise about this sort of stuff, technical purity. In some cases, I will admit, it is completely okay to found an entire language of technology on one or two technical points because they're so fundamental and important. But in most cases, it's, it's just ideology. The other thing is we don't care about evening factor. I'm so hardcore because I did this in so-and-so language that was so hard to use. Beyond the looky what I did. You've got to do something <laughs> to show people, right? So, so just um, a few things real quick. So a few truths about programmers, uh, or about good programmers, in my opinion, in my humble opinion. They're lazy, but in a good way. They want things to work. Right? They, just, they just want to get their work done. They want things to work and move on to the next interesting problem. They are tinkerers, and they're temperamental tinkerers. What I mean by that is that they are obsessed with details some of the time. <laughs> they are obsessed with certain details, the details that interest them. The other details, they absolutely will not stop ranting about. You know, this thing sucks. Why don't you know about this argument? And then they use different library. Oh, it doesn't support this parameter, that argument. But temperamental tinkers. And all of these things really, you know, it really overlaps with you know, spoiled kids. I mean, you spoil the kids who just want to have fun, sometimes creating Fortune 100 companies. Right? So, Fortune 100 company comes out of some spoiled tinker. But that's actually, you know, we laugh at this, but this is reality. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing, but this is reality. That's what computers let us, let us do. So that gets back to this thing of fun and passion. And so when I first came to this country from China, my mom was absolutely flabbergasted by the American education system, uh, by how much all the teachers and, and, and administrators were concerned with whether or not the students were having fun. And she thought that it was an absolutely crazy situation. Who cares about fun? You do your homework, you have food to eat. Who cares about fun? And what she didn't understand about that is that fun is actually an alias for passionate creativity. Now, no, well, maybe educators say that. I'm not going to say they don't, but I never heard it expressed that way when I was growing up and people talk about fun algebra and fun jump. No, I mean, you know, so, but that's the truth of it. Real fun is when you have, when you're passionate about something and you're able to create stuff. And early adopters tend to be passionate, in general, of technology, um, as distinguished from fanboys, but that's a finer point that I didn't have to the slide. <laughs> but passion, so, so passion leads to motivation, right? If you're passionate about something, you're motivated to use it, to create using it, to meet other people who are using it, and, and whatnot. And motivation will lead to productivity. If you actually have to do that thing that overlaps with your work, you'll be amazingly productive. Uh, productive. And of course, you can't do two leads without also saying leads to something. So, um, <laughs> well, yeah, okay. Productivity as a bullet point in a PowerPoint slide usually does lead to suffering. But that's <laughs> so some truths about software, some arguable truths about software. 
is that there is actually a distribution of capability out there in the world of programmers. That it is not just, even though most people can pick up a computer and do some programming with practice and with coaching, the honest truth is if you want people to do really exceptional things, there is this sort of curve of, of, of skill. And some people um, actually argue, uh, they, they argue that that horizontal axis is actually a log scale. And, uh, and I, I wouldn't disagree with them about that. But basically the bottom line is that software development, real software development, writing real software that you don't curse at 10 years later, it, is a craft, right? And, and because you have this skill distribution, um, you really have to treat it as a craft. And I'm going to do an aside here and make some observations about languages. So this is a completely controversial uh, random graph <laughs> that I did with a really great tool called, um, oh, that's interesting, you kind of screwed up the label, uh, with a completely great tool called OmniGraph Sketch, um, which just lets you draw random graphs with no data. So that's really good. <laughs> um, so this is a sketch of, well, it's a really useful tool, right? <laughs> so um, this is problem difficulty versus the average effort, the effort that will take your average programmer in that language to do. And I think this is sort of, you know, this is one subtle Java Java is that it starts up on the y-axis. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, but the other thing about this though, I, I, I mean, what, what I was trying to say here basically is that Python really lets, I mean, you can tackle problems very nicely with Python that otherwise you just, I mean, the curves are different, right? When you're above y equals x versus when you're under y equals x. But the, the truth is that because there's that distribution, you actually have to model each of these as kind of a wide sort of thing. And so, um, again, this lightning talk session takes you long on the slide. But basically, I think the key thing to realize here is that Java and C++ both have this kind of divergent thing. They both diverge, but not very much, and they both generally skew like that. They both track that one path. Perl is just this like, kind of a line broadening. But Python actually has a fan out, okay? And what I'm trying to say with this picture, um, so this picture apparently is not, well, maybe it is a thousand words. But basically that if you have really talented Python programmers, they can get things done much, much better. Um, so some exercises, draw lines corresponding to the expected effort for each language. So basically, how long people in each of these languages think it will take them versus how long it actually takes them. That's also a very interest, interesting and insulting plot. Um, <laughs> so the difference between reality and that is what I'm going to call the moxie gap. And basically how long you think it's going to take you to do something and how long you know in your heart of hearts in the past it's taken you to do something. That determines, actually, that modulates your motivation. Right? And the other exercise is to add lists to that graph, which I'm not going to do because there's a non-zero chance that in my old age one day I'm going to be one of these old you know, garagey sort of whispers. Um, there's a non-zero chance of that, so I'm not gonna put it on there. So there's one thing that is true about Python, which is that it scales with the ability of the programmer. We go into enterprises and basically sell this point, that we will, you have a work group of 10 programmers or scientists, and Python allows the really productive people to do really great things, and the not so, you know, program-centric people to actually still get things done. So that scalability is huge. That's that broadening in that line. So novices can do simple things. Really bright people can then go deeper, build tools that the novices can then leverage. I mean, the beauty of the structure of the language lets you do all these things. And so when you have lone sysadmins kind of, you know, cooped up in, a, in, in, the, uh, in their offices, they can whip out Perl scripts day in, day out and get things done, no problem. But if you have mavericks and small work groups that are just struggling to try to get solve real problems, they like Python because they can then throw it over to someone else and still offer some level of extensibility to their end users. So Python meets the enterprise is really what I was going to call this talk. Um, but it's not that enterprise, all right? It's actually kind of that enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> and so I like this enterprise a lot more than others. That's a bit biased there. But basically, there's the, the original what I call the original sin of enterprise software development. It is not that you know, you can add more people to software project and make it faster. That's not the original sin. The original sin is the idea that programmers are fungible resources. They are human resources to be thrown around. Anthony Bourdain and your Mexican line cook, same deal. <laughs> so, in low productivity languages, this is almost true, but Python 
if you really want to leverage it for the enterprise, you can't use that model. You really, your managers can't think about their programming team that way anymore. And so the good news is that more businesses are using Python. There is a, there's kind of been a watershed moment in terms of, I think, enterprise adoption of Python. We're seeing it you know, in our company, what we do. I think a lot of you guys are seeing that as well. It's a really great thing. But the bad news is that more businesses are going to start using Python, which means that more managers are managing Python programmers. That's actually not so bad. The problem is when more managers are managing X Java programmers. Now this is this is where you know I'm gonna take my M thought kind of here about <laughs> But basically <laughs> the idea is that so I'm this is not I'm not really hating on Java people, alright? I'm just saying there exists this concept called Java people. <laughs> <laughs> <And> <laughs> The idea here is that there are people who are good programmers, but who are so used to doing Java, C++, that for them it's not, you know, that moxie gap is huge at this point. And I think for everyone in this room, pretty much, that moxie gap is very small. I mean, you want to write, a, just, uh, this is sort of getting back to Dave Beasley's talk about the uh, DIY concurrency. Why does that be hard? We, we just did it, right? So, the question then, is how do we foster this Pythonic mindset? <laughs> Alright, people, and, and the bondage discipline, I love that term, because that's really what it, it is like. They're really great C++ programmers. I use C++ for a number of years. I can appreciate that it's a very good language, but it's still, there's this bondage and discipline aspect to it. Um, and so, the suggestions that I have, this is the serious part of the talk, is that if you are in a team where you have to evangelize Python to a large group of people who are skeptical, who have just had this, the, you know, this huge moxie gap. I would say, make programming fun again. Show them the fun of Python. Show them how you're, and not in an offensive way, but show them how 100 lines of Python can replace this huge thing they were doing, but in a fun way, right? <laughs> Get them passionate again. Find something they're really interested in. I think that, that, that uh, the brewing plot thing was hilarious, right? I mean, use it for something real at home. People generally aren't hacking out 10,000 lines of Java to solve a little cat feeder problem at home, right? They're baking down a bash script or a Python script. And that hopefully will restore the motivation. Um, so why am I doing this talk here at SciPoc? One, because most people here are scientists who need to get things done, who came to Python because they needed to get things done. They're early adopters who, have, who, who get passionate, and you're likely to be Python evangelists within your groups and organizations. You have people coming to you saying, hey, what about this Python thing I saw on Slashdot or Reddit or Dig or whatever. I, I know you kind of did something with that you know, last month. Tell me about that. So because you guys are more likely to be early, uh, to be evangelists within your organizations, um, just wanted to offer a few suggestions. So first, the things to do to evangelize Python is to introduce it to your friends. Give them a nice introduction, take a little bit of time, talk to them about it, why you like it. Um, but the most important thing is to make useful tools. That, more than anything else, will win people over. Be friendly, don't be snarky like me. <laughs> be friendly to them, all right? And be open, if you have to write a Pythonic tool that has to integrate with a big old legacy system, make it so that that legacy system can easily use your tool. That's going to get you much more buy-in than if you just build a whole new, completely much, much better Python thing over here. Um, and the things not to do is to not introduce your frenemies. Don't try to drag people kicking and screaming into a Python environment if they are, if they have the mindset that they're just going to try to prove you wrong. That, I wish that were a laughable thing, but that actually does happen. You have that sort of situation. Don't force them unwilling, basically. And in doing so, if you, you know, don't vaccinate a whole group against dynamic languages, against the power of Python. So basically, in summary, all right, we all enjoy coding Python. We want to continue coding Python. In fact, this whole talk happened because this morning I was taking a shower, and I was thinking about 10 years from now, am I still going to be coding Python? Am I going to be coding Python? And why? And why not? And I thought about, well, all these businesses are using Python. How's that going to change language? So I sort of started thinking about all this stuff. And so the idea is, I do want to continue coding in Python, but we don't want to wasteland the failed deployments. We don't want a lot of people saying, oh, we tried that Python on Rails thing, and it just didn't work. We're back to scratch. You know, <laughs> again, <the> snarky. So <laughs> basically, make useful tools. Let that change minds. And that's my thought. <laughs>